all to the second edition of Eclectic Ananta speaker series in 2016. Uh, we at Eclectic Northeast, uh, we felt that, uh, you know, in Northeast we get very limited opportunities to hear and exchange ideas, listen to different perspectives on different subject matters from domain experts. Uh, similarly, we, uh, whenever we are outside Northeast, we get a lot of people who are very curious and eager to learn and uh, know more about Northeast and its people. And so, uh, realizing this need, and uh, we thought that you know there's a much uh, need for a platform where we can have interesting interactions and invite people from outside for meaningful interactions. And that's how this initiative came up. Um, Eclectic Ananda Speaker Series. Um, the idea is to invite uh, globally known, uh, nationally known um, thought leaders uh, to this part of the country. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a, uh, you know, a very successful first edition with uh, Serpent Chavi Rajavad uh, from Rajasthan, uh, which uh, happened a couple of months back and uh, it was very insightful and engaging. Previously, we have also hosted uh, speakers like um, Nobel laureate um, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, Meghna Desai, um, we have had Olympia Maricom, so you know, it's, um, it's really uh, different subjects. So, and uh, uh, we have partnered up with Ananta Espen Center in this initiative. Espen Center is a non-profit organization which focuses on leadership development and uh, open dialogue on different uh, important Indian issues. <coughs> Today we are very honored and humbled to have with us a very um, special speaker. Um, he is a very eminent scholar, writer, historian, uh, Professor Sugata Bose, and um, who is also a parliamentarian. So he would be engaging with us on the topic looking east within and beyond India. Uh, we have with us uh, um, Bhuya, the very versatile person who will be moderating this for us. Uh, Dikonga, I invite you to take this forward. Thank you so much, Tanushri, and I welcome all our guests, especially on Professor Sugatamos here in Guwahati for the Ananta Espin talk series powered by Eclectic. For organizing such events for the benefit of the people residing here in the region and also for the benefit of our dear students. At the very outset, I would like to take this privilege, which is also an honor to introduce to all of you a person who is so dynamic, who we all know, Professor Sugata Bose. Sugata Bose is the Gardner Professor of History at the Harvard University. The professor has served as the Director of Graduate Studies in History at Harvard and has also acted as the Founding Director of the Harvard's South Asia Institute. Bose was educated at Presidency College, Calcutta and at the University of Cambridge where he obtained his doctorate. His scholarship has contributed to a deeper understanding of colonial and post-colonial political economy, the relation between rural and urban domains, inter-regional arenas of travel, trade, and imagination across the Indian Ocean and Indian ethical discourses, political philosophy, and economic thought. Professor Bose has many books to his credit. A Hundred Horizons, The Indian Ocean in the Age of Global Empire, which is released by Cambridge, the Harvard University Press, 2006, Modern South Asia, History, Culture, Political Economy, and many such books. He has served as chair of the Presidency Mentor Group, advising on the rejuvenation of Presidency University as a world-class center of excellence and as a member of the Nalanda Governing Board. At the invitation of Chief Minister of West Bengal, Mamata Banerjee, he had agreed then to contest the 16th 
Lok Sabha elections from the prestigious Jadavpur parliamentary <coughs> constituency. And he won the election to parliament in May 2014 by defeating his nearest rival by a margin of over 1,25,000 votes. Today, it's an honor for all of us to have Professor Bose with us this morning. And uh, I'm sure it will be one lecture series which will open many eyes and also open thoughts going forward in this very fantastic subject which we all have been reading in various journals and newspapers, looking east, within and beyond India. We are familiar with looking east and acting east. So this is within and beyond India. And Professor has a fantastic journey which he has had himself to share with all of us this morning. Before we invite Professor Bose to be here with us, we also have a book releasing ceremony with us today and for which I would uh, also welcome Gautam Bhattacharji, who is here with us, who is General Manager of State Bank of India. He is recently posted to Guwahati, and I'm sure we'll see more of him going forward. Before that, let me take a few steps down to welcome and invite Professor Sugata Bose here with us. Good morning, sir, and thank you for being here with us. Let me also profoundly invite Mr. Gautam Panchaji, GM, State Bank of India. He will felicitate Professor Bose. So we'd also request uh, Mr. Machas to be with us for a while because we would also now like to welcome on stage Mrs. Ajanta, who actually has translated a fantastic book called Mahanish Karman, details of which the original one, which was in Bengali, Professor Bose will touch upon. I would request Ajanta to come forward here and to also release the book which has been translated to Assamese by Ajanta this morning. And now may I also request Professor Boas, Mr. Pachaji, to directly release the book today morning. Asmi's translation of Mahanesh Kama. Congratulations and uh, thank you so very much for being here with us. guests, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, teachers, professors, and dear students, I now leave the stage to hear the distinguished professor, Sugata Bose, for his deliberation. Thank you, sir. Distinguished guests, uh, dear students, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, 
the Ananta Center and uh, Eclectic and its uh, dynamic young leader, Donushri, for inviting me here to Guwahati uh, in Assam. I'm truly delighted to be here. And many thanks to DCOM for being the master of ceremonies and for providing a very generous uh, introduction. When the Battle of Britain was raging over the skies of uh, London in 1940, India's colonial masters had their most uncompromising opponent, Shubhashan Rabos, safely behind bars in the presidency jail of Calcutta. Shubhash had other ideas, however. On November 29, 1940, he launched a hunger strike in prison, challenging the government. Release me, or I shall refuse to live. Nobody can lose through suffering and sacrifice, he had written on November 26, 1940, in his political testament addressed to the British governor of Bengal. If he does lose anything of the earth early, he will gain much more by becoming the heir to a life immortal. The governor, John Herbert, decided to send him home on December 5th, 1940, having resolved to rearrest him as soon as he had recovered his health. If he resorts to hunger strike again, Herbert wrote blithely to the Viceroy Linlith Gold on December 11th, 1940, the present cat and mouse policy will be continued and its employment will serve both to render him innocuous and to make him realize that nothing is to be gained from a series of fasts. By that time, Shubhash had already summoned his nephew, Shishir Kumar Bose, and asked him to plan his escape from India. And the book that you uh, just saw being released, uh, Mohanish Raman, is my father's first-hand account of that escape. Uh, just as Gautama went on his Mohanish Raman in search of enlightenment and became the Buddha, so also Shubhash went on his Mohanish Kramun and came back into the pages of history as Netaji. Uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose had called my father and asked him, Amarakta uh, Kaj Kotte Barbe? And my father never stopped doing Netaji's Kaj or work throughout his life from December 1940 onwards. You are irrepressible, whether ill or well, Mahatma Gandhi wrote to Shubhash on December 29, 1940. Do get well before going in for fireworks. But the rebel had already prepared for the fireworks and was waiting for the right moment to light the fuse. So on the night of January 16, 17, 1941, Shubhash Chandra secretly left his Elgin Road home in Calcutta disguised as Muhammad Ziauddin, a North Indian Muslim insurance agent. He was driven by Shishir in a German-made wanderer car to Gomo Railway Junction, some 200 miles away, in the neighboring province of Bihar, which has now, of course, become Jharkhand. There, Nitaji boarded the Delhi Kalka Mail and went to Delhi, changed to the Frontier Mail to go to Peshawar, where he was received by a political associate, Mia Akbar Shah. And then he trekked across the rugged terrain of uh, the tribal territories and Afghanistan to reach Kabul. He actually was trapped in Kabul for nearly two months, and he was desperately trying to get out. At that point, a telegram from the Italian legation was intercepted uh, by the British and decoded, and an order was given to assassinate Shubhash Chandra Bose as he was thought to be traveling through Iran, Iraq, and Turkey to Europe. But in fact, Shubhash Chandra Bose did not take the Middle Eastern route. Uh, he obtained a false passport in the name of an Italian diplomat, Orlando Matsota, and traveled through Soviet Central Asia to Moscow, and then he flew to Berlin. Now, you might well ask, 
you know, why did Shuhash Chandra Bose, who was a socialist in his political beliefs, go to Nazi Germany? And the answer, I think, lay in the prisoner of war camps of Germany and Italy. Ever since uh, 1921, when Shuhash Chandra Bose joined the nationalist movement under Mahatma Gandhi's leadership, the civilian masses had taken part in the freedom struggle. But the Indian soldiers were still serving the British King Emperor. And Shuhash Chandra Bose wanted to replace the loyalty of Indian soldiers to the British with a new loyalty to the cause of the Indian nation. So to begin with, he had traveled through the northwest frontier to Europe. But as soon as Germany invaded the Soviet Union, the plans that he had of an armed thrust for from the Northwest had to be given up. He did set up a free India center in Europe. He raised an Indian legion, but his eyes began to turn to the East. After uh, Japan entered the war, it was very clear that Shubhash Chandra Bose wanted to be in Asia and not in Europe. But it took some time to to cre uh, create plans for a very difficult journey from Europe to Asia. And this happened in February 1943. He boarded a submarine and he traveled for 90 days from Kiel in Germany, uh, came all the way down the Atlantic Ocean. There was a transfer from a German to a Japanese uh, submarine in the Indian uh, Ocean. And from there, he was taken to Sabang in Sumatra. He, from there, he flew to Tokyo and then returned to Singapore to take charge as the Supreme Commander of the Azad Hind Forge or the Indian National Army. And in the months that followed, he electrified massive audiences of civilians and soldiers with his speeches. He gave his uh, soldiers the slogan, Chalo Delhi, on to Delhi, reminiscent of the 1857 rebellion in India. I uh, was recently in Burma last August, and I visited uh, Bahadur Shah's tomb in Rangoon, the tomb of the last Mughal emperor. And that's where Netaji and the Indian National Army had a special parade on September 26th of the Declarations of Independence of Ireland and of America. In January 1944, the headquarters of the Azad Hind government were moved forward from Singapore to Rangoon. And having first seen action on the Arakan front in February 1944, the INA moved into northeastern India towards Imphal and Kohima on March 18th, 1944. So with Chalo Delhi on their lips, the INA crossed the Indo-Burma frontier and carried the armed struggle onto Indian soil. Shuhash Chandra Bose's association with India's northeast, however, goes back to 1927. The hill resort of Shillong was chosen as the most suitable place for the ailing Shubhash once he returned to India after a long spell in Burmese prisons. Several family members accompanied him to the hills. Shubhash spent the days playing with the children on the mountainside and the nights reading and writing letters. The eminent doctor Vidhan Chandra Roy came to treat him and also his seven-year-old nephew, Shishir, who was suffering from fever. And Shishir, of course, later was his charioteer during the escape. After some time, his sister-in-law, Vibhavati, and her children had to return to Calcutta. I felt rather uncomfortable after you all left suddenly, Shubhash wrote to Vibhavati. The empty house gave a forlorn feeling. The mind became restive. I seemed to have lost for a while the moorings of my daily life. It will be no exaggeration to say that I felt a pang in my heart. He had imagined he had transcended worldly attachments, but now had been given a stern reminder that he was not wholly unattached. It took some time to readjust to his quiet surroundings 
and this is how he described the northeast around Shillong. The azure sky, green fields, the mountain ranges all around, the play of light and shade in the forests, the continuous roar of the waterfall, he wrote to his sister-in-law reassuringly, all this keep me contented. When the rains cleared, he would go out to commune with nature as he had done as a child in Kotok, and he was reminded of Shakespeare's lines. And this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. A decade later, as president of the Indian National Congress, Shubhashtandra Bose played a key role in the politics of Assam. In order for the Congress to be able to present a united national demand to the British, Shubhash believed at least one of two conditions had to be made, met, a settlement with the Muslim League at the All India level or coalition governments with Congress participation in most, if not all, of the Muslim majority provinces. When Shubhash assumed the presidency of the Congress, the party governed seven of the 11 provinces of British India. The four exceptions were Punjab and Sindh in the northwest and Bengal and Assam in the east. Shubhash had been opposed in principle to office acceptance in 1937, but in the absence of a mass Satyagraha campaign and given the decision to form ministries in seven provinces, he felt governments in the remaining provinces of a coalition kind would improve Hindu-Muslim relations and strengthen nationalist resistance to British rule. As Congress president, Bose was instrumental in ousting the Muslim League ministry headed by Muhammad Sadullah and installing the Congress-led coalition government led by Gopinath Bardoloi in Assam. That gave the Congress party control of ministries in eight out of the 11 provinces. Of course, the world has changed and we can see how few provinces the Congress run today in 2016. Assam, interestingly, voted uh, for Shubhash Chandra Bose in the contest for the Congress presidency in 1939. He won many interesting states. He won Bihar, United Provinces, uh, which is today's UP, he won the South, excepting Andhra, where Sitaramaya emerged victorious, but he took Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka. But Assam stood by Shubhash Chandra Bose in 1939 when he was challenging Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and uh, he continued to argue for the special status of Assam. In a long letter dated March 28, 1939, he charged Nehru with holding a doctrinaire view on coalition governments. And he advised him to tour Assam before pronouncing on that question again. Regarding Bengal, uh, Bose commented, I'm afraid you know practically nothing. And he went on to say, that the unity that we strive for or maintain must be the unity of action and not the unity of inaction. Once World War II, uh, broke out. He felt that Assam was special enough for the Congress Ministry not to resign, even if all other Congress Ministries resigned. Seven years later, in Noakhali, Gandhi consistently argued in favor of provincial rights. He admitted that Shubhash Bose had been right in contending in 1939 that Assam was a special case and that the Gopinath Bardoloi ministry should not resign along with the other provincial governments. We look to the Congress, Gandhi pointed out, and then we feel that if we do not follow it slavishly, something will go wrong with it. I have said that not only a province, but even an individual can rebel against the Congress and by doing so, save it. This is a very interesting statement that, that I think has very powerful contemporary resonance. You can see that the Mahatma had come a long way from imposing the discipline of the high command on provincial units, as he had tried in 1939. He said it was incumbent for the central leaderships of both the Congress and the Muslim League to make their policy, and I'm quoting Gandhi, 
appeal to the reason of the recalcitrant province or groups, unquote. India's northeast was crucial in the valiant struggle of the Azad Hind Forge. As I mentioned, from January 44, the headquarters of the Azad Hind Forge was moved forward uh, to Rangoon. And the INA saw its role as serving as a catalyst for a civilian uprising against British rule. The capture of Imphal and Kohima would open the way for its advance into the rest of Assam and Bengal, where a hero's welcome awaited them. And all that was required for ultimate success, Shubhash Chandra Bose said in January 44, was that action within the country must synchronize with the action from without. John W. Gerber offered an analysis of Netaji's strategy in the nation on April 22, 1944. Gerber noted that Bose had proclaimed in November 1943 that he would march into Bengal and Assam, and when that happened, any hopes Chungking, that is Chiang Kai-shek's government, might entertain of a new road from Assam would be dashed. Gerber observed that Bose was on the verge of achieving his goal, and if he succeeded in doing so, it would be a major political and military victory. The United Nations could no longer ignore Bose, Gerber argued, as he had begun to turn his words into action. The promised march to Delhi, however, was halted in Imphal, and the British, with American air support, was able to break the siege after three and a half tense, tense months and beat back the Japanese and the INA forces from the outskirts of Kohima as well. And after that, of course, Shubhash Bose retreated in 1945 on foot with uh, women of the Rani of Jhasi regiment from Burma to Thailand and then to colonial Malaya and Singapore. Eventually, of course, the INA emerged politically victorious when the Red Fort trials were held after the end of the war. In his last order of the day, Shubhash Chandra Bose wrote, the roads to Delhi are many and Delhi still remains our goal, urging his civilian followers never to falter in their faith in India's destiny. Netaji expressed confidence that India shall be free and before long. The Burmese leader, Barmore, described Shubhash Chandra Bose as a great Asian dreamer. Okakura Kakuso, a Japanese ideologue, wrote a book called The Ideals of the East, way back in 1903, which had a memorable first sentence, Asia is one. Sister Nivedita, added a further embellishment in her introduction to the book. Asia, the great mother, she wrote, is forever one. Now, there were multiple articulations and alternative visions of this famous claim and debates about the extent to which this was tenable. But what we need to recognize that is that Asia as a space and a concept in the rights, writings of Asian thinkers contained a creative spark, absent, in European cartographic depictions of Asia. A world historical transformation is underway in the early 21st century as Asia recovers the global position it had lost some 200 years ago. Yet the idea of Asia and the spirit of Asian universalism were alive and captured in a variety of registers during the period of European imperial domination. One of the most innovative exponents of an Asia sense was Rabindranath Tagore. Each country of Asia will solve its own historical problems according to its strength, nature, and need, Tagore wrote during a visit to Iran in 1932. But the lamp that they will each carry on their path to progress will converge to illuminate the common ray of knowledge. It is only when the light of the spirit glows that the bond of humanity becomes true. Okapura had conveyed this spirit of Asian universalism to India. Uh, he was a, a great uh, connoisseur of Japanese and Chinese art, and he worked in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and he was instrumental in inviting Tagore to lecture at Harvard uh, in 1930 
and those lectures were published uh, in a book called uh, Shadhana, Sadhana. And uh, when Tagore eventually won the Nobel Prize for Gitanjali, the Harvard Crimson, the student's newspaper, had a very awkward report. It said, the Nobel Prize for Literature has recently been awarded to the British Indian poet, Mr. Rabindranath Tagore. This is the first time that the award has been made to other than a member of the white race. Last spring, Mr. Tagore gave a series of lectures in English at Emerson Hall, dealing with subjects of Far Eastern philosophy. Now, Okakura had come to India first in 1902. Nivedita introduced Okakura to the entire Tagore family and a very formidable cultural, literary, artistic, and political bridge between South and East Asia was built. And Okakura later sent two very major Japanese painters, Taikan Yokoyama and uh, Shunso Hishida, to Calcutta. And Obunindranath Tagore, Tagore's nephew, um, learned the Japanese wash technique from Taikan and painted the iconic image Bharat Mata, Mother India, 1905, in that style. Shunso Hishida's rendering of that image on a giant silk scroll was paraded around in procession in the streets of Calcutta. Indian nationalism had become fused with Asian universalism. I'm showing you this image because I'm trying to suggest that Swadeshi was not inward-looking. It was outward-looking as well. The iconic image of Mother India is executed in the Japanese wash technique. Also, this is an image which ought to instill a spirit of service, um, seva, among uh, young people. And this is not something that should be used in a coercive manner, as, as, as is being done in India uh, today. Now, when European nationalisms were in a deadly embrace during the First World War, Tagore journeyed on an easterly direction aboard the Japanese ship Tosamaru. When the ship docked in Hong Kong, Tagore said something with great foresight about the future balance of power in the world. The nations which now own the world's resources, he contended, fear the rise of China and wish to postpone the day of that rise. This is exactly a hundred years ago, 1916. Of course, the postponement has now reached its limit. China has risen. He then, of course, went to Japan, and he was very impressed with Japanese art, less impressed by the Japanese penchant for imitating European nationalistic uh, imperialism, and it was only after rebuking Japan on that score that he made the Pacific crossing to the United States, where he wrote his, uh, and delivered his critical lectures on nationalism. And in fact, I quoted from this lecture and a poem that he appended to this book in a recent parliamentary speech uh, when there were all these debates about nationalism and anti-nationalism. Now, at this juncture, Asian anti-imperialists were not inward-looking. They were interested in Wilsonian concepts of self-determination. Some were impressed by Lenin. The Bolshevik Revolution had taken place. But I would suggest that the years 1919 to 1922 constituted the quintessential Islamic universalist moment in global history, which almost cast the Asian universalism of 1905 into the shade. At that time, Mahatma Gandhi wrote, let Hindus not be frightened by pan-Islamism. It is not, it need not be anti-Indian or anti-Hindu. For Mahatma Gandhi, a territorial conception of nationalism was perfectly compatible with an extraterritorial anti-colonial sentiment. But then, of course, Kamal Ataturk abolished the Khilafat. And at that stage, many Indians began to rekindle the lamp of Asian universalism. Tagore made another journey to China and Japan, uh, this time in 1924, taking along with him the painter uh, Nandulal Bose, as well as a scholar of religion, uh, Kiti Mohan Sen, 
uh, and, uh, and the historian uh, political theorist Kalidas Nag. And in 1924, the Chinese intellectual Liang Qichao evoked the age-old brotherly affection between India and China while welcoming Tagore. But the radical Chinese youth of that period mistook the modern Indian poet for a traditionalist and derided the message of spirituality from a defeated nation. Tebo's advocacy of a shared Asian cultural universe had a mixed reception. There were some friends who had been hurt by the Orientals Exclusion Act in the United States who set up an Asiatic Association in Shanghai. When he went to Japan, he was again received by Taikan and Nandolal Bose was introduced to the masterpieces of Japanese art. Japan's invasion of China in 1937 undermined the idea of Asia as never before. Rabindranath Tagore was dismayed. Shohash Chandra Bose published a long essay titled Japan's Role in the Far East. Japan, he con con conceded, had done great things for herself and for Asia. He recalled how Japan had been a beacon of inspiration for all of Asia at the dawn of the 20th century. But he asked, could not Japan's aims be achieved, quote, without imperialism, without dismembering the Chinese Republic, without humiliating another proud, cultured, and ancient race? He then went on to draw some ethical lessons for India from the conflict in East Asia. Standing at the threshold of a new era, he wrote, let India resolve to aspire after national self-fulfillment in every direction, but not at the expense of other nations and not through the bloody path of self-aggrandizement and imperialism. The 1940s were a turbulent decade for Bengal, for India's northeast, for the whole of India, Asia, and the world. Tagore, of course, had passed away, lamenting in his, the last year of his life the tendency of human civilization to kill itself with its own dagger. So he was spared, having to witness the horrors of war, famine, and partition. In 1943, once again, using the Japanese wash technique and tempera, Nandolal created this haunting image of Annapurna and Rudra. Annapurna, who is seated on a lotus, holds a bowl of rice in her hands. Before her stands Shiva, reduced to a skeleton, holding a begging bowl. Shubhashtandra Bose was by now, of course, in Southeast Asia, organizing the Indian National Army, but he was still very concerned about the conflict between Japan and China. The Indian people, Shubhashtandra Bose, who was now allied with Japan, said in a broadcast in November 1943, really sympathized with China and the Chinese people. He looked forward to the day not far off when by means of an honorable peace, Japan would withdraw her troops from China. Even Gandhi had declared in late 1942 that he, had he been free, he would have led a mission to bring peace between Japan and China. Now, this may have been unrealistic, but it indicated a wish to cling to a faith in an Asian universalism being destroyed by rival nationalisms. At war's end, the idea of Asia was still alive. An Asian relations conference was convened in India before independence, welcoming Sharad Chandra Bose, Shubhash's elder brother, to Burma in July 1946. Aung San evoked the vision of a pan-Asiatic federation in the not too distant future. It was the coming into being of independent nation states with unitary concepts of sovereignty imported from modern Europe that fractured the idea of Asia in its political dimension. In the domain of culture, Japanese art enabled the spirit of Asian universalism to survive the depredations of Japanese nationalistic imperialism. After Indi Indian independence, the painter, Nandolal, began to quietly and confidently celebrate the Indian countryside in his art, creatively drawing on the Japanese Sumie style. Sometimes these days, there is a, a tendency to exaggerate the element of anti-Westernism in Asian thought. 
all that the best Asian thinkers were questioning was the European claim to monopoly on universalism. They were quite sk skillful in negotiating and even accepting Western knowledge while taking a strong stand against Western imperialism. Tagore's vision of creative unity certainly had a global scope, as did his travels. Yet, as one of my students, former students, Chris Manjapra, has said, suggested, Asia became a privileged geography of relations for him. As the West retreats into parochial neurosis, Pankaj Mishra has written in a recent book, Asian countries appear more outward-looking, confident, and optimistic. No alternative intellectual universalism, he declares on the other hand, has successfully challenged the prestige and authority of Western moder modernity. But this is a case of misrecognition of political failure as intellectual failure. I believe there was no intellectual failure uh, you know, in, uh, among uh, Asian uh, scholars. The four decades since the end of the World War II represented the heyday of the territorial model of the European nation-state in Asia. It is only in the 21st century that universalist aspirations swept aside at the moment of formal political decolonization have received a new breath of life. During the last decade, Asian scholars and intellectuals have been looking beyond the nation in efforts to invest supranational interregional arenas such as Asia and the Indian Ocean with new meaning. They have been attentive to the power as well as the ambiguities underpinning the idea of Asia. These innovative forms of spatial imagination are of importance in determining the future of heightened Asian economic and cultural connections. Asian economic inter interdependence has increased rapidly in the last 15 years, with East, Southeast, and South Asia conducting well over half of their international trade among themselves now, as compared to a third in the 1980s. Cultural flows have been enhanced, contributing to fresh synergies in the domains of Asian arts and humanities. The pace of intra-Asian migration has quickened, with people on the move across the vast continent in numbers unimaginable between the late 1940s and the 1980s. However, there are always, of course, obstacles that are placed in the path of human migration. And the world of contemporary Asian thought has been grappling to make sense of and give direction to these emerging trends. There are pre-colonial networks of overland and maritime trade and finance, as well as anti-colonial visions of political solidarity that have been invoked in attempts to soften the hard borders of post-colonial nation states. Asian intellectuals have run ahead of managers of Asian states in creatively trespassing across national boundaries. It may be just as well that Asian connectivity is less state-driven than European integration. You can see what's going on in Europe right now with the Brexit vote coming up in June. However, the more far-sighted among the statesmen and diplomats of Asia have not been far behind in this project of reconceptualizing the contours of their continent and its relations with the West. The discourse has moved far beyond simply trumpeting the uh, superiority of Asian values, as Lim Kian Yu used to do, to a more nuanced articulation of an interconnected and interreferential Asia seeking to hope, uh, seeking to shape a global future. An Asia without borders may not be on the near horizon, but an Asian free trade area and a common Asian cultural universe are already in the process of formation. We need a sense of history George Yeo, the former foreign minister of Singapore, has written of how much our forebears have benefited and learned from one another. Without this humility and the profound respect for the contribution of others to our well-being, we will suffer hubris and make terrible mistakes. The dream of Asian universalism had been shattered in the 20th century by the conflict between Japan and China. 
its fate in the 21st century will depend to a very large extent on the ability of China and India to, to peacefully manage their simultaneous rise. Both Asian giants are beset with internal problems of inequity and the ability to address those may be just as important as the state of their mutual relations. The future of two other countries, Bangladesh and Myanmar, will be salient in the unfolding destiny of Asia. The people of India's Northeast can play a key role in determining the course of the connective history of Asia. I played some role in the passage of the Indo-Bangladesh Land Boundary Agreement, which comprehensively settled that border uh, uh, last year. And changes in Burma need to be watched very carefully, as it is going through a very delicate transition to democracy. But if matters improve in these two countries, you know, India's Northeast may well become the hub for all manner of uh, Asian linkages. Our freedom fighters faced great challenges in traversing the crescent that stretched from Singapore to Calcutta. In a lyrical order of the day, Netaji had proclaimed in 1944, there, there in the distance, beyond that river, beyond those jungles, beyond those hills, lies the promised land, the soil from which we sprang, the land to which we shall now return. There in front of you is the road that our pioneers have built. We shall march along that road. We shall carve our way through the enemy's ranks, or if God wills, we shall die a martyr's death. And in our last sleep, we shall kiss the road that will bring our army to Delhi. The road to Delhi is the road to freedom. Chalo Delhi. It was very difficult to cross the hills and jungles of India's northeast for our freedom fighters. But the road that is now being built to link Southeast Asia with India, and I use it in both literal and metaphorical terms, the road, has the potential to cre of creating an arc of prosperity through India's northeast. Intellectuals of the last two countries aspired to keep that lofty goal in their sights. Let me conclude with what Tagore said about this question in 1932. He wrote, We are the people of Asia. Grievances against Europe are in our blood. Ever since their pirates and marauders came to suck the blood of this weak continent in the 18th century, they have disgraced themselves before us. If a new age has dawned in Asia, let Asia give it utterance in a new, authentic voice. If instead, Asia merely imitates Europe's beastly cry, were it even to be the lion's roar, it will be a loss. Thank you very much. And this lovely journey which you've titled Looking East Within and Beyond India. We now have an interactive session with uh, our distinguished audience, we have uh, our guests, we also have lecturers and professors, and we also have students who would be interested to take part in this discussion going forward. Professor Bose, before we open the house to answer discussions and questions from our distinguished audience here, I personally would like to thank you once again for giving us this insight and that you have mentioned that Northeast should and by now should have been the hub of all Asian linkages. What do you also have to say from your vast experience about how India today sees the Northeast with uh, Prime Minister Modi's exercise and vision? What do you think is your take on our boundaries that we've created so far and uh, how much respect do we have for the international boundaries keeping special mention of the Arunachal Pradesh and the China boundary that we share so closely.
my hands. Uh, to my mind, a conceptual breakthrough always needs to precede uh, the breakthrough in political log jams. Let me see if I can explain uh, a somewhat difficult concept in simple terms, particularly for the young students uh, who are in this uh, audience. There are two <coughs> concepts or terms which we need to rethink. One is sovereignty. Now, some of you may have known about the European so-called Westphalian concept of sovereignty, which suggests that there can really only be one sovereign of any particular piece of territory. That is the basis for the construction of European nation states. In our part of the world, certainly in India and in much of Asia and Africa as well, we had a very different conception of sovereignty before the British came here. We had a conception of layered and shared sovereignty. Think of the words that we use. We use Raja, Maharaja, Maharaja Dhiraja. So a Raja is also a sovereign. Similarly in Persian, Shah, Shahim Shah, King of Kings. Um, and you know, our great political thinkers always felt that in India, you know, even an emperor was only a king at the center of a circle of kings. Now we have democracy, and therefore our political center should simply be a center within a circle of many, you know, regions. So that's one. The other is borders that you mentioned. Again, as part of this, you know, European concept, we always thought that there had to be hard borders around these nation states. While we here in India and Asia were in the past always comfortable with fuzzy borders, we did not make a fetish about you know, lines or maps that we tend to make today. We learned that from Europe. The sad part of the story is that Europe in some ways is beginning to leave these rigid ideas behind. If the British had not thought in terms of some kind of shared sovereignty or soft borders, they could not have had the Good Friday Agreement with Ireland to try and resolve their Irish problem. And yet we are still clinging to what Curzon may have taught us or what Mountbatten may have left us with. <coughs> and that's why, and, and unfortunately both China, I mean even though it was a semi-colony, not a formal colony, and India, have to move away from some of these, you know, uh, conceptions of unitary sovereignty, very hard borders, uh, in order to make, you know, real progress. Um, so you asked about uh, Prime Minister Modi, who apparently is in this area in Shillong, or he was yesterday. Uh, and um, again, we have to think about it both in terms of federal relations within India. There has to be, you know, some uh, sense of the layering of political power, allowing the regions a lot of freedom of maneuver. And also when we think in terms of relations with our neighbors, um, you know, we have to make a determined attempt to resolve some of these border issues. Uh, you know, when I was working on the Indo-Bangladesh Land Boundary Agreement, um, I, mean, I was amazed to find how many people were so concerned about losing uh, a few hundred acres of territory to Bangladesh, which would result, uh, which would happen if there was an exchange of the enclaves. You know, it was so minor compared to the larger breakthrough that was, you know, about to take place. But I think what we were able to manage was that we. we worked out a very fine balance between the national interest, between the state's interest. I had to actually persuade my own chief minister, West Bengal, uh, and of course the human interest of the poor people without any citizenship rights who are living in these enclaves. 
But we got that done. At least with one of our neighbors, we have comprehensively resolved our you know, border issues. With Pakistan and China, there will be bigger challenges, but I don't believe that they are insurmountable. And so far as internal relations are concerned, I'll simply say that I'm never concerned about differences. People know how to respect differences, accommodate cultural differences, and then rise above them. We have to prevent differences from turning into divisions, which become the basis of conflicts. Thank you so much. And before we open to the house, this is something I personally wanted to ask Professor Bose, that being a part of such a supreme legacy, being the grand nephew of Subhash Chandra Bose in your tenure as a professor in Harvard and various other visiting universities, were there any special moments you faced or which made you feel so very proud that you belong to that legacy when you were out of the country? Any special well, encounters that you had? Uh, well, um, let me say that, you know, my father always told me uh, never to you know, claim exclusive membership of the Bose family or the Bose Khandan. And there is a story that he relates in this book, Mohanish Khan, that was released today. He was in prison um, in Punjab, and after the end of the Second World War, he was released. And he came out in Lalpur and then went to Lahore, and he heard a new slogan, uh, Bose Khandan Zindabad. And he heard that slogan all the way as he was coming by train from Punjab to Bengal and he came to Calcutta. And his father, my grandfather Sharad Chandra Bose, called him and said that don't let all this turn your head. Remember that all the slogans that are being raised for you are in fact nothing more than Shubhash's reflected glory. So you go back to your medical studies, you've lost four years, become a doctor, and then you can do whatever you want uh, sort of later on. And so that is the message uh, which I always received. And Shubhash Chandra Bose always used to say that his family and his country were uh, co-terminus. Uh, and therefore, and, and I have to say that all my school, school friends and college friends made life easy for me by, by not constantly reminding me of the accident of my birth. So I think that all of you are members of Netaji's family, and especially in the Northeast, where there were people who really fought uh, side by side with the Azadin forge that he had formed. Great. So before, now it's time that we open to the house. I would request, uh, especially the students, to please uh, ask questions and uh, the only request being that please, by now I'm sure you've formulated your question properly. I would only request you all to be brief, to the point, and ask the question directly to Professor Bose. We all see a hand. We have good 15 to 20 minutes to take this forward. So the seniors in the audience, if you have questions and if you keep it ready, we'll be saving up a lot of time. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, myself, Rashmi. So as the topic is look east within and beyond India, I'd like to highlight on look east within India. Like if we see the eastern countries in India, like Bihar, Jharkhand, Orissa, West Bengal, and the Union territories like Andaman and Nicobar Island, so like I just want to ask like many people who for getting an employment they don't go to these countries like you like Bihar, Jharkhand, Orissa, or West Bengal. They come to Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai and all these things. So in the case I can say that Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, all these things are much more developed than the rest of the countries. So for me, why there is so much of inferiority for developing the countries like this West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand and all. Like if people instead of coming only to the places which has been concerned like Delhi, Mumbai, etc., why people don't go for employment to these countries? Or people from Bihar come to Assam. 
people from Bihar yes. in, say, uh, in fact I can say that come to Assam for employment and they decrease the economic status of India. That's the reason I can say India is still a developing country. So what will be the reason behind this? We can look after this problem. That's a very good question. Um, and um, the reason why uh, young people uh, don't come to the eastern states, and you've extended the east to include Bihar and Jharkhand as well, even though Bihar and Jharkhand, in many socioeconomic uh, sort of uh, criteria, are more linked to northern India, to UP, and so forth. But still, it is uh, entirely correct to point out that there are no employment generating uh, uh, industries or economic opportunities in many of these uh, eastern states that, that you have mentioned. And that is why young people from the east, broadly speaking, including the northeast, travel to the, to the cities which look as if that they are sort of booming. So we must actually <clears throat> try to devise economic policies in the East which will keep and attract young talent. And I have to point out that even though India is growing very fast, we keep talking about our 6 to 7 percent growth rate, even in, a, even in a difficult global climate. What we are having at the moment is very high output growth with practically no uh, employment growth. And this is a sure recipe for economic, social, and political disaster. There is one other point that I will make, which I have also made in Parliament. I'm a bit tired of hearing from uh, Prime Minister Modi and some of his uh, associates in government that they will somehow um, bring development which has happened in the West, they claim, and the North, uh, to the East. You know, we keep hearing about the Gujarat model, and somehow development will be brought to the East, including the Northeast. I simply remind my you know, parliamentary colleagues that while it is true that in, in terms of economic growth, there may have been faster growth in some parts of the North and West compared to the East, the real division in India, uh, you know, when it comes to the social sectors, health, education, and so forth, is between the North and the West on the one hand, and the South and the East on the other. And on these indicators, the South and the East do much better. We should not be complacent, but just think of the gender ratio in our country. You know, it's terrible, right? you know, 92 uh, women to 100 uh, men. But this ratio is far worse in the north and west, including Gujarat, I might add, than in the south and the east. So in thinking about, you know, economic development, we constantly have to consider what kind of development do we actually want. Uh, does it also bring equity along lines of gender? along lines of uh, class, caste, tribal affiliations, and so on. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Uh, sir, I am Nimsha Patra from Royal Global School. So my question to you is, uh, as stated uh, by you, that Differences should not lead to divisions. So India is a vast country and different people have different ideologies. So what do you suggest? How will India rise up to its true potential and Asia as a whole? You see, when I... Um, there are two ways of thinking about unity. Uh, you can say that everybody is one essentially, that we all have to think of ourselves as citizens of India. Um, and sometimes when you say that, you're trying to impose sort of unity from above. 
On the other hand, Rabindranath Tagore, whom I mentioned, used to say that where there is genuine difference, it is only by respecting that difference and then restraining in it, it in its proper place that it, it, it's possible to forge unity. You cannot really have unity by issuing legal fiats that everybody is one. Now, one variation of this everybody is one kind of way of uh, achieving unity has taken the form in our country at this point of what I call religious majoritarianism. And I think that this is actually very counterproductive and will lead to more divisions than real uh, unity. And uh, that's why uh, I think it is much better to respect differences. Uh, and the problem with the religious majoritarianism idea is that, you know, we, are all, we all live in a democracy, right? But in a democracy, in a real genuine democracy, a majority has to be earned. But if you say that a particular religious community is already in a majority, then you are saying that we already have a majority on a prefabricated religious platter. And that is completely antithetical to democracy, genuine substantive democracy. And that's why I suggested that we ought not to be afraid of differences. Uh, we have a long history of respecting and accommodating differences to create you know, a larger unity. And my view is that at least in India, not to mention the rest of Asia, a free and flexible federal union will in the longer term be a stronger union. And this is true of other countries as well. I visited Burma recently. They have all kinds of ethnic differences. And there too, I think, a federal union would be a better way to go. And we also glorify India being multi-ethnic and polycultural. So I'm, I'm sure these things need to work in a together in a very progressive manner. Any other questions? There's a gentleman here who wants to ask a question. Excuse me. Can we have the gentleman the blue shirt, please? And I still urge young students to formulate your question properly so that, you know, we I, can save our time. Uh, this is Pradeep Talukha. I just have a query actually, uh, respecting the differences that we, we talked about. Uh, we have a, like, considering the Northeast having a pretty multicultural ethnicities from the beginning of the year. And especially if I talk about the Modi government and the Nagaland's Nagaland uh, freedom, because as journalists we travel over there, there is a vehement uh, feeling over there that uh, there is a rampant aggressiveness by the government to build roads, to go into, deep inside to the uh, the, 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 the territories, you can say what. So they feel that uh, that's invading their own homes, which, uh, because uh, uh, now going over there, asking opinions about government's policies, they always say that uh, we just don't want to be uh, scrutinized for our own actions. We just live uh, to our own boundaries. Because when we talk about looking at East policy, which is now we turn into an act policy, they somehow do, do, doesn't like the kind of developments or arms that we have been. So what is your opinion on this, that how should we respect their opinion and also look forward to developments or bring developments to the rural Northeast? Because this is a very crucial thing according to the Asian countries over, over the other area. I think it is extremely important in devising plans for infrastructural development to take local people and local communities along. States, by their very nature, um, you know, want societies over which they rule to be more legible. You know, uh, and, um, and and I, I understand that impulse uh, of of the state. Um, but while I think that there is a case to be made for greater interconnectivity of all kinds, including roads, as you mentioned, uh, which will in many ways you know, help the Northeast 
to be connected with the dynamic economic regions of, uh, of Southeast Asia. I think it's extremely important, uh, you know, not to, uh, you know, allow, you know, the people of Nagaland, as you mentioned, uh, feel invaded by, by development. There has to be a consultative process. Otherwise, you know, this will, this will never work. I don't believe for a moment that uh, the people in the Northeast, whether in uh, Nagaland or Manipur or Mizoram, are necessarily, you know, completely inward looking. Uh, people understand they are rational and what will be to their ultimate, you know, economic uh, benefit. But one shouldn't force it on them. Just as I said, you know, I, I much prefer uh, you know, a, a union forged from below, which is somewhat flexible, than a kind of artificial unity that is sought to be imposed from above, which never works. But I think there is a huge uh, communication gap between them and the government. There is a huge communication gap. It has happened in other instances as well, when large dams have been built in other parts of the, of the country. Uh, and this communication gap really needs to be bridged. I might mention in passing that FISO, uh, the great Naga sort of leader, uh, uh, had great respect uh, for uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose. He is on record. And also to some degree Mahatma Gandhi because he felt that those were the kinds of national leaders who, have, who would have understood the, the aspirations uh, of the smaller regions and local communities and so forth in building uh, you know, a, a prosperous India. And Professor Bose, before we take the next question, since we are discussing this point, it's been midnight also to my limited travels uh, deep inside uh, states like Nagaland, Arunachal. Well, there is a fear about the Chinese part. But however, if you go to very remote villages where you have the village headmen in a, in a place like Nagaland, the amount of respect that gentleman derives from his people, I'm sure if you there's nowhere else in the country that if you have if you have a boar, wild boar that you've shot or you've hunted and you want to eat, the first piece goes to the village head. And it demands that kind of a respect. So and it feels good to be in the Northeast with so much of greed. It's just space that matters if we're, we're talking about development, that space part. So I'm sure if you tell him that uh, would you like a Rolls Royce, he'll obviously say no, you know, in the sense. So let's have the almost one point. Recently, the election, the between you, the small uh, participatory dialogues in India vision government. So I just want that the government, if they use this participatory dialogue in a more wider conversations, I might mean, my brain a better result. Yeah, they must be serious about it. Should just be a slogan because we reduce these phrases to slogans. If it is genuine participatory dialogue, yes, it is all to be welcomed. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm uh, RJ Alia from 92.7 Big FM. My question for you is that, do you think that uh, more than a leader, we need more visionaries in uh, fields? And especially it's uh, high time for us to you know, set criteria for our political readers. For example, if there are many states where we have uh, leaders or you can say, you know, political person who are not even passed their class 10 exams. So do you think that it's time for us to change those criteria and, and we need more visionaries uh, for our country? Well, I agree with you that uh, we need uh, visionary leaders in different walks of life, uh, not just in the domain of uh, formal politics. Uh, however, I don't agree with you, uh, or at least your suggestion, that uh, we ought to change the criteria for having political representatives or political leaders. Now, our biggest failure in the post-independence period uh, has been in the field of uh, primary education and also secondary school education. What we should have done in 10 to 20 years, uh, we are somehow managing in 60 to 70 years. But we cannot disenfranchise those who have been left behind, who have perhaps not been able to complete their schooling, and uh, deny them the uh, opportunity of uh, serving uh, in elective uh, institutions. Uh, 
This, I'm afraid, ha has been done in a couple of states, uh, Rajasthan, for example, uh, and I think it's a very retrograde step. Um, our goal should be, in fact, uh, to provide at least basic school education to everyone, rather than to say that those who haven't been able to complete 10 will not be able to hold uh, uh, hold uh, elective uh, office. And I do hope that visionary leaders from different walks of life will also contribute uh, to the political process. Sometimes I feel that you don't have to be a full-time politician to make a real difference in the arena of, uh, of politics. Next question. Let's take it from the gentleman behind. Uh, so, uh, as we all know that the uh, Northeast region has played a, a very big role in the formation of the uh, Azad Hind Force or the Indian National Army. But what we have, uh, but in my whole life, uh, my in my life of uh, uh, schooling, I have never come across. I mean, the, uh, which I mean, in the history textbooks, I have never come across about the. Uh, like the, about how the northeastern states uh, plays, uh, I mean they play a role in in, in the formation of the army. But uh, and for example, even I have never I have never seen any textbook mention about the battle of Koima, which is a very very uh, battle of yes, battle which is, of yes that uh, that that war was a very important war, not just for the formation of the Indian army, but it's, a, it's also part of the World War II. So I, what is uh, my, my question is that, what is your thought about that? How, because if, we, if, we, if that kind of, if that kind of historical events is mentioned in the next book for us to learn, we can really, uh, uh, what, uh, we can really want to know more about it. So yes. what is your thought about it? Yeah, and uh, Professor Post, you could also add on to the syllabus part the history textbooks going in the region of the country in general from that point. Uh, yes, um, I think it's very important uh, not to let the state, particularly the centralized state app apparatus, uh, to, you know, write uh, and control the history textbooks. And, um, and, and that's why I would, you know, strongly urge, in fact, you know, scholars and students from the Northeast uh, to begin to write their own histories. Uh, and uh, that is the way to, you know, combat what are exclusions uh, that take place uh, in what could be called uh, national narratives, which leave the contributions of certain regional peoples out. Uh, and, um, you know, fortunately, at least in the historical profession, uh, there is more attention being, you know, given uh, to developments in the Northeast and the freedom struggle in the Northeast than may be evident uh, from the textbooks that you may be, you know, required to read. And all that I will say to the young people is to always question, have a critical mind, don't necessarily accept what you are reading in textbooks. Um, ask for more. Um, you know, when you find that your questions are not really answered by what appears on a particular page of your textbook, you know, say that I would like to know more and try to search out, you know, what is, what is true knowledge. I want to know uh, what... If you could introduce yourself first. Uh, I'm Shreya Gupta from Royal Global School. Uh, I want to know what role can we play as residents of Northeast in turning Northeast into a hub of all Asiatic activities? You know, just as uh, it's very important uh, to study the history and the culture and the politics of your own region, we were just hearing that how that gets to be left out in broader national narratives. By the same token, uh, you ought not to be, you know, completely 
mired in your own local and regional concerns. Those of you who are living and growing up in the Northeast uh, ought to wish to learn more about the history and the culture and politics of, of Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, because there are very deep historical links which tie Southeast and South Asia through you know, India's uh, Northeast. So I think while being firmly grounded in your you know, own cultural setting, uh, you know, you have to look beyond the borders of northeastern India to learn more about Southeast Asia. And I think the Northeast can really become a hub of more dynamic economic activity if it can in fact transform itself into, a, you know, you know, the key, you know, uh, cluster of nodes that would, uh, that would connect flows of uh, trade, investment, but also flows of ideas and culture between Southeast Asia and, and South Asia. So I think this is an opportunity that the people of the Northeast should try to seize because we are living in a very particular historical moment of Asia recovering its lost status. And with uh, time also being a constraint, can we also shift the focus to a few senior lecturers who we get to see or seniors who are here, if you could like to put in a question to Professor Boss. And we will take. And if you could, if you, like I was suggesting, if you could write them together, and take a note, or speak them out together, then comprehensively, Professor Boss would be very happy to answer them. Meanwhile, let's hear it from you. Good afternoon, Professor Bose and uh, the Council Soman there. Uh, my question... Uh, so introduce yourself, please. You're from my name is Soman, I am from Tata Institute of Hindu Science, right. Guwahati campus. Uh, I am born and brought up in Jamshedpur and I did my education in Calcutta, where I am doing my Masters in Social Work from Guwahati campus. Uh, perhaps uh, my friend, my journalist friend, he spoke about the development thing uh, even last Question session uh, was infrastructure and uh, the eastern zone to be made the development hub. Uh, what I could see uh, reading the newspapers and all, uh, going through the news and all, the development has been politicized. And uh, could you just throw a light on us as a parliamentarian or as a professor uh, with the shared experiences uh, in terms of the national interest or the nation interest or eastern inter East Indian interest? your experiences on it because development has been politicized so your experiences being a professor and now you're a parliamentarian so perhaps on it thank you look there ought not to be a contradiction between uh, the interest of the northeast and the larger national interest but i have no hesitation in saying that uh, the northeast has historically uh, particularly in the post independence decades been terribly ne ne neglected in the center's grand plans for development. I mean, uh, in many uh, ways, uh, Assam in the later part of the 20th century was seen to be a repository of uh, natural resources, uh, uh, which were often utilized for the development of other parts of the country. But, uh, you know, the actual needs of the uh, Northeast, and particularly, you know, Assam, were, uh, were, were not uh, addressed. So given this, uh, you know, historical imbalance, I do think that very special attention needs to be given to the uh, development uh, of the Northeast. But the Northeast itself is very diverse, as uh, Eclectic was uh, pointing out uh, to me. Um, you know, even within states, there's diversity, not to mention the, the you know, the, the subtle uh, differences uh, among the seven states of the uh, of the Northeast. So yes, so rectification of the historical imbalance which had uh, 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 meant that development uh, had bypassed uh, the Northeast, uh, but uh, at the same time, I think, uh, North, Northeast, Northeast's future in some ways lies not by turning inward into itself, but in fact sort of looking outward 
uh, forging stronger connections, not just with the rest of India, but deep economic and cultural ties with the rest of Asia. Thank you. Let's give it to hear it from Mr. Agarwal. That could be the second last question due to the paucity of time this morning. Good afternoon, Professor Bose. Uh, I'm asking the historian. I'm not uh, looking at the Northeast, I'm overall in the history, perspective of history. Uh, when we say history repeats itself. With World War I, World War II, uh, the world is right now in a kind of a border camp. Anything can happen in North Korea, the Middle East, ISIS. Why don't we learn from history? History never repeats itself, or at least not in quite the not same total, way. Not in, total, not, in total. not in the same way. Um, and you're right that, you know, very often uh, we don't learn from history. So let us say that Europe did not learn the lessons of the First World War, which then resulted in, a, in an even more catastrophic uh, second uh, World War. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes we do learn from uh, history. So despite all the problems that are being faced by the European Union right now, the fact of the matter is that France and Germany, which, uh, you know, had fought absolutely bloody sort of conflicts in the first half of the 20th century, were able uh, to rise above uh, those animosities uh, to refashion the prosperity of Europe. Why shouldn't we be able to do that uh, in um, Asia? Uh, so while history does not repeat itself, history does offer lessons. And is, it is really up to us uh, whether we imbibe those uh, lessons or not. And that in some ways was the thrust of the lecture that I gave today, uh, which was in the form of a historical allegory, that the idea of Asia has been around for quite some time. But we imitated Europe, and that's why Japan and China fought in the same way as France and Germany. Uh, but can we avoid that in the 21st century? There are problems, as you say. You know, North Korea, you mentioned, and. Uh, ISIS and, and, and so forth. But can we write, you know, can we avoid those kinds of, of, of calamities which we ought to be able to anticipate uh, if, you know, we have a sense of history? Thank you, sir. And I think uh, we'll have to. Last question, sir. Our Netaji Research Bureau President, Namda Prof. Jani, and Asha Mayamdan Kutham Ashlen. আমার সরাসরি প্রশ্ন হলো স্যার নেতাজিকে আপনারা বাঙালিরা নিজের সম্পত্তি বলে পারেন কখন আপনারা আমাদের আসামিকে নেতাজিকে আমাদের সম্পত্তি বলার কিছু সুযোগ দিবেন আর আপনারা আসামি কিছু একটা করবেন আপনি ঠিকই বলেছেন তবে নেতাজি কিন্তু নিজেকে শুধু বাঙালি মনে করতেন না নেতাজি যখন নাইনটিন এ আয়ারল্যান্ড গিয়েছিলেন তখন একজন সাংবাদিক নেতাজিকে পলিটিক্যাল লিডার ফ্রম বেঙ্গল বলে পরিচয় করিয়ে দিয়েছিল তো নেতাজি তখন বলেছিলেন যে বেঙ্গল আর আয়ারল্যান্ডের সম্পর্কটা নিবি কিন্তু আই এম নট আ বেঙ্গলি লিডার আই এম এন ইন্ডিয়ান লিডার আর আমি এই কথাটা আমি আমি আগেও দেখেছি আমি প্রায় উড়িষ্যা যাই এবং উড়িষ্যায় অবশ্য সেখানে নেতাজির জন্ম কটকে তাই ওরা নেতাজিকে ওড়িয়াই মনে করে কিন্তু আমাদের মনে রাখতে হ্যাঁ বাঙালিদের কখনোই নিজেদের সম্পত্তি মনে করা উচিত নয় নেতাজিকে কারণ আপনি যদি নেতাজির সংগ্রামটা দেখেন তাহলে দেখবেন যে যারা আজাদিন ফৌজে লড়াই করেছিল তাদের মধ্যে যারা যাদের মানে মিলিটারি একটা এক্সপার্টিস ছিল তারা বেশিরভাগই ছিলেন পাঞ্জাব থেকে বা নর্থ ওয়েস্ট ফ্রান্টিয়ার প্রভিন্স থেকে আর যারা সিভিলিয়ান রেক্রুট ছিলেন তারা বেশিরভাগ বিভাগই ছিলেন দক্ষিণাত্যের থেকে কারণ আপনি যদি ভারতবর্ষ থেকে দক্ষিণ পূর্ব এশিয়ায় মাইগ্রেশনের ইতিহাস দেখেন 
তাহলে তামিলনাড়ু থেকে অনেক তামিল সাউথ ইস্ট এশিয়াতে গিয়েছিলেন তাই তাদের নিয়েছিলেন নেতাজি আজাদ হিন্দ ফৌজে আর তারপরে তো দেখা গেল যে যখন এখানে এসে যুদ্ধ করতে হলো তখন যারা নাগাল্যান্ডের বা মণিপুরের অধিবাসী তাদের সমর্থন না পেলে সেই যুদ্ধ চালনা করা সম্ভব হতো না তাই নেতাজি সকলেরই আপনারা অবশ্যই নেতাজিকে নিজের নিজেদের এবং অসমের এবং নর্থ ইস্টের একজন নেতা হিসেবে দাবি করতে পারে আমরা একটা জিনিস করতে পারি সেটা হচ্ছে মানে আমরা যেটা করেছি আমরা নেতাজির কালেক্টেড ওয়ার্কস বের করেছি খুব ভালো তথ্যচিত্র আছে নেতাজির ওপরে আমার নিজের তৈরি করা এই যে যেসব ছবি দেখলেন এরকম তো হাজার হাজার ছবি আমাদের রয়েছে এগুলো অবশ্যই ছড়িয়ে দেওয়া যায় আপনারা যদি এখানে করতে পারেন একটা খুব ভালো নেতাজি এবং ভারতের মুক্তি সংগ্রামের ওপরে খুব ভালো এক্সিবিশন হতে পারে এখানে আমাদের যেসব মেটেরিয়াল আছে সেগুলো এসে এখানে নিশ্চয়ই আমরা দেখাতে পারি আমরা কিন্তু বেঙ্গলের বাইরে করেছি হয়তো নর্থ ইস্টে ততটা করা হয়নি কিন্তু সারা মানে ভারতবর্ষের অন্য জায়গাতেও কিন্তু আমাদের আমাদের কাজ হয়েছে থ্যাংক ইউ সো মাচ অফিসার বস ফরিং দিস ক্যান হ্যাপেন গোয়িং ফরওয়ার্ড অ্যান্ড টু ইয়েস This is the last question from uh, Mrs. Deb, who is the chairperson of Fiki Flow here in Guwahati. And uh, she wants you to share, since you are a writer yourself, she wants you to share a story with us, Northeasterners, which might enrich again our thought process. And with that little story or an experience, we would uh, point up today's discussion. So, yeah, I'm sure Professor Boas has a lot of stories. মিটিং Um, fought alongside Netaji for India's freedom. For example, Abid Hassan used to come and stay with us, who was Netaji's only Indian companion on the submarine voyage, and I heard stories from him. Uh, S.A. Ayer, who was the Minister of Publicity in the, of the Azad Hind government, came and uh, told us stories. I heard from him how Netaji wrote the proclamation of uh, Indian independence throughout the night. So I, I have those uh, uh, very, you know, vivid memories. Um, but I will tell you the story of one of my experiences. Uh, this was in um, 1991. I was filming some interviews for a film that I was making for Netaji Research Bureau, which everybody could see, called Netaji and India's Freedom. I was in Patna. And The person I was interviewing was Mehboob Ahmed, who had served as our ambassador to Canada, but in his youth, in 1945, he had served as Netaji's military secretary. So I was uh, rolling the camera, you know, asking him questions, and Mehboob Ahmed couldn't speak. You know, tears would be flowing down his eyes. So I would stop the camera again, and this went on for, for, for some time. And uh, then he finally, you know, got himself together. And he, he then told me that, you know, do you know, you know why this is happening to me? You see, in, in the months after independence, I had the privilege of working with Mahatma Gandhi just for a few months. And then he said, in the post-independence period, since I was taken into the Indian Foreign Service, I had the great honor of working with Jawaharlal Nehru. But he said that there was only one leader I was prepared to die for. And that leader was Netaji Shuhashchandra Bose. So that was his quality of leadership. 
And then I could understand that this was a leader who would not ask any of his followers to do anything that he himself would not do. He was a kind of leader who would not ask his followers to take any risks that he himself would not take. So that was the quality of leadership. That was an example of leadership that came through to me as I talked to Mehboob Ahmed in the early 1990s, decades after Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose had passed uh, from the scene. And I really hope that the young people will actually focus on his life uh, because there's so much to learn from his book of life and the message there is one of you know having a mission in one's life and accepting uh, service and sacrifice as part of that mission thank you thank you so much <laughs> let me actually rise and uh, thank professor bose so you can have your seat such a honorary scholar and great historian and it gives us immense pleasure to have him with us this morning. I thank uh, Eclectic and the Ananta Talk series for making this possible for us. And I would also like to thank all our sponsors. As you can see State Bank of India is so already here with us. And uh, our regular partner, 92.7 Big FM and uh, Indian Oil and also to thank our hospitality partner in Tibata by Taj. Thank you, Professor Sugata Bos. Thank you so much, Dikampura, uh, uh, may I request Anusri to uh, give a token of appreciation for very skillfully moderating this session. Thank you so much, Dikampura. <laughs> Professor Bose, uh, thank you for a most engaging session. And a uh, picture really speaks a thousand words. So thank you for sharing those very special images. You know, they not only helped connect the dots, but really gave a very uh, keen insight into the historical perspective. And you did such an amazing job of uh, connecting history with the present and uh, um, you know, taking us through that and very patiently uh, answering some very interesting uh, questions which came up from the audience. So thank you for being with us. Uh, Tanusri had talked about uh, Ananta Aspen Center and uh, um, you know, us providing a forum uh, for values-based leadership um, and inviting um, thought leaders for open forum discussion. What she hadn't mentioned and what I'm very proud of is uh, uh, Tanusri is actually part of uh, our uh, Young Leaders Program, which is called the India Leadership Initiative. And uh, uh, Professor Bose is uh, a trustee of um, Ananta Center as well. So we are very, very delighted and proud to uh, you know, have them uh, associated very closely. And we were delighted to start uh, um, at Tanusri's initiate of the eclectic Ananta speaker series. Um, you know, this was the second, as she mentioned, and uh, this is uh, going to be a quarterly. Um, we plan to have this quarterly and also take it to other uh, northeastern states. Uh, so we look forward to that. Thank you for being a wonderful audience, and uh, we look forward to having you with us uh, for the future sessions. Thank you, and have a wonderful weekend.